I was born in the middle of a city. I grew up in the middle of a city. I worked in the middle of a city. I love the city. Take me to the countryside and I just anticipate getting back to civilization. Not for me, the wide open spaces, the clean air, the instant coffee. For me, it's the traffic, the tube, the crowds and the espressos. I'm an urban man through and through, and I know some of you, but not all of you, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. For you, London is the city. And I find your enthusiasm for London is quite infectious. Uh, but I don't believe that London and the city has the answer to all our problems. Listen to what Samuel Johnson said. Why, sir, you find no man at all intellectual who is willing to leave London. No, sir, when a man is tired of London, he's tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford, all that life can afford. Now, we're here for four months, and very often we go out into the countryside for a little while, and it's always a treat when I see the shard in the distance, and we're getting closer and closer back in to where the shard is. In Australia, farmers have a saying, manure is good, but it's no good in a heap. You've got to spread it out for it to be good. And what is a city? A city is a heap of people. In the case of London, seven million people in a heap. Proud people. People who are concerned about their reputation. Self-serving people. That's a city. So this afternoon at the beginning of this series, I want to ask first the question, what is a city? And when you go to the book of Genesis in the Bible, you'll find that a city is, or was originally a substitute for God. People said, we don't want God, but we want what God can give to us. And so we will substitute for what God can give. For God, we will substitute a city. If you flip back there in Genesis chapter 4, you will see the first record of a city in verse 12. And in Genesis 4.12, God tells Cain who has just murdered his brother Abel, that he will be a restless wanderer. And in verse 14, Cain acknowledges, I will be a restless wanderer. But by verse 17, Cain has built a city and named it after his son Enoch. You see, Cain provided an antidote, a remedy to God's curse. He stopped wandering and built a fortification, a place of security for himself. He'd had enough of God's curse. The city was his attempt to contradict the curse of God, to stand up for himself. He wasn't going to go on passively and bear the verdict of the judge. He'd had enough of restless wandering. And so a mark of his resistance, a mark of his rebellion against God was to build the city Enoch. Now flip over, if you would, to Genesis 11. The city becomes a substitute for what God could give. It's the mark of humankind's rebellion. It's in our nature to be rebels against God. You remember right back in Genesis chapter 1 that God reveals himself as a colonizer. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue the earth. And after the flood, the animals increase in number, as does the human family. And it is to fill the earth. Just have a look there at Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. And you have a record of that dispersing in chapter 10. Look at verse 5. The sons of Japheth spread out. Verse 18. The sons of Ham are scattered. Verse 30. The sons of Shem stretch east. And so the summary is there in verse 32, the very last verse of chapter 10. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Spread out, move out, be fruitful, multiply, extend your rule over the earth and subdue it. And then we come to Genesis 11. And they simply decided that enough is enough. They've found a nice plain in Shinar as they moved east. And they'd settled there. They'd had enough of scattering. 
They'd had enough of subduing. God hadn't changed his mind. They had just changed theirs. And the first city is founded, according to Genesis 10, by Nibrod, Nibrod, whose name means we shall rebel. And so the writer here in chapter 11 is reminding us in verse 3 that there is advance in technology. They are making brick. There is tar for mortar. There is one common unifying speech. Look at their speech. Look at verse 3, for example. They say, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Verse 4, come, let us build ourselves a city and its tower. Come, let's, come, let's. You've heard that before, haven't you? They're aping God. Back in chapter 1, God says, come, let us make man in our own image. Let's us build ourselves a city. Let's us build ourselves a tower. And the double motive for doing that is there in verse 4, that we may gain a reputation for ourselves and there will be no need for us to continue to be scattered because we can stay here in a fortified place. You see, the thing is, we can defy God if we stand together. There's strength in numbers. There's enough of us and there's safety in numbers. We can take God's place. We can resist God if a number of us do it together. So there is verses one to four, one common language. Here they are on the plains of Shinar. They stand up to God and they build a city. They will not disperse. No, they can resist him. No, I'm not going to be a restless wanderer. I'll build a city. No, I'm not going to be dispersed through the earth. We'll build a city. In what I believe to be the finest piece of writing from a theological sense, since the New Testament, it is John Calvin's Institute of the Christian Religion. In those institutes, Calvin begins the institutes by saying this, all true wisdom consists of two parts. One, knowledge of God, and two, knowledge of ourselves. And these two, knowledge of God and of ourselves, are connected by many ties. That is why the plight of man is always a problem to the secularists. They cannot understand. Derek Bird, the Cumbrian taxi driver who goes and kills people on that Saturday morning. The secularist has got no answer. We cannot understand how a person could do that. He did not seem to have any mental problem. In Sydney, we had a man by the name of Wade Frankham. One Saturday, he went out into the shopping centre and he just took out a gun and he randomly killed seven people. And one of the commentators in Sydney, a great secularist, said, this is a mongrel world. Who's got any answers to it? You see, the secularist who divorces God from their thinking will not have an accurate estimate of the human condition. They'll always be over -optimist, overly optimistic about the human condition because these two, knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves, are connected by many ties. What are we seeing in these early chapters of Genesis? We are seeing that as people, we are constitutionally rebellious against God. It is our second nature. Now, in Sydney, I heard an Anglican bishop, imagine this, from the Sydney Diocese once say that he got onto a train at Sydney Central Railway Station. There was a sign, it was an old carriage, and it said, spitting prohibited, penalty for spitting, 20 pounds. He said even as he read the sign, he could feel the saliva building up in his mouth. We are constitutionally rebellious. We won't scatter. We won't subdue. I will not continue to be a restless wanderer. But the other thing we are, constitutionally rebellious, we are also insecure. All of us are insecure, and we are insecure enough to need building up and a reputation from others. It is all important. So we don't look for God for his assessment, we look to one another for our assessment. We don't look to God for security, we look to ourselves for security, and we are slavishly dependent on ourselves. The reputation will come from ourselves. But the irony here, friends, is that in the end they will receive the reputation, but it is not the reputation they would want. Ananias and Sapphira, let's get a reputation for generosity, and now for 2,000 years they've had a reputation, but not the one they wanted, rather the one for double-facedness. And here they want a reputation, and they get a reputation, Babel. 
That's the reputation, the root word meaning confusion. This is the heart of the city, substitute for God, a reputation from others. Let's stand up to him. But if you look in verse 5, you will see the bridge to God's response. Verse 5, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. God comes down. And notice that whereas in verse 3 they say, let's come, let's make. And in verse 4, come, let's build. In verse 7, God says, come, let's go down. It's no effort on his part. He doesn't need assistance to take him down. It's the easiest thing in the world to go down. And when he goes down, he sees what they have done and he scrambles the language for without communication, this place truly is the place of confusion. They cannot cooperate socially. They cannot cooperate on a project. They cannot cooperate commercially because verses 8 and 9, the Lord has scattered, has scrambled their language and he has scattered them over the face of the earth. And notice this is the emphasis. Look at the start of verse 8. The Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the whole earth. And look at the end of verse 9. There the Lord dispersed them over the face of the whole earth. The, the very thing they wanted to resist is the very thing which was imposed upon them. Here is the pride of the human heart, people gathering together in their crowded wickedness to maintain peace and security, where the only real value is the value of imposed tolerance. It has always been the great civic imperative. The only way we can stand together in our ignoring of God is if we tolerate anything in first century Rome, in BC Babel, and in 21st century London. Unquestioning tolerance is the manifestation of human wickedness because unquestioning tolerance must abandon moral judgment and moral conviction. And the multiplying of languages slows down this evil. What they most feared scattering happens. And how do we allow wisdom to interpret historic narrative in the Bible? There is a proverb that says this, you might have sung it with your children. There is no wisdom, Proverbs 21. There is no insight. There is no plan that can, see, can succeed against the Lord. Here is the great lie. We always believe it. We worship and serve the created. We worship and serve human engineering skill. We worship and serve human ingenuity. We worship and serve human creativity and productivity. All good. But when they are manifesting resistance of God, then they are the great lie, according to Romans 1, from which all evil flows. The God who gave humankind language as an instrument to name things and rule things and humankind uses that language to defy him now judges them through the scrambling of that language. The words you speak, a gift of God to rule, a gift of God to reflect our dependence, but we turn it into defying words of God. And the scrambling of our language is now the mark of God's judgment. Well, is there any hope? Well, the Bible, of course, is ambivalent about the city because it tells us of God's work in another city. Flip over, if you would, to page 1096, the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. 1096, the city of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Where the city fails, God succeeds. Here in the early verses of Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit comes on the 120 believers who are gathered there. The effect, if you look at verse 4, is that we are told they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, from which we get the word glossolalia, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there are, if you look in verses 9 to 11, 15 different language groups which are listed there. And in verse 11, those people say, we hear them telling in our own tongues, again glossolalia, the mighty works of God. What were these tongues, these glossolalia? Look at verse 6. 
And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own, literally, dialect. So what they were hearing was in their own language groups, 15 different languages. That's what they were hearing. And so what you're seeing here is the reversal of the scattering. This crowd comes together. The Holy Spirit has given the disciples the ability to speak languages without going and learning a language, without a language laboratory. They speak, each speak, to these 15 different language groups. So they are not united by a common language. They are not united by a common culture. They are all so different. What unites them is what they hear. Look again at verse 11. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, the wonders of God. It is the gospel itself, the mighty works of God, which brings them together and unites them all in refreshing diversity. Notice this imposed unity of other faith systems that everyone there is one holy language and we all look the same. It's so foreign here to the Bible. I remember one time going to a worldwide Christian gathering and we all stood up and sang in our own tongues, our own dialects, the words, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. The Germans had a brass band. The Africans had drums and wonderfully expressive dancing. The South Americans had pipes. The Latin Americans had guitars. The North Americans had handbells. The Australian Aborigines had didgeridoos. The British would have had a pipe organ if you could transport it there. The Indians would have had a scither. All we all looked different in our clothing. We all spoke different languages. We all liked different foods. We could not have been more different. What united us? Verse 11. The wonders of God. What united us was the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel does what Babel could not do. Man substitute from, for God, the city, is always short of what is needed. There is no substitute for God. In Jerusalem, it is God's gospel that unites. It is God's gospel which gives security. It is God's gospel which gives us the only reputation which matters. It is God's gospel which promotes our diversity and scatters us to the ends of the earth. It is God's gospel which builds community and breaks down barriers between us and anticipates that in the new Jerusalem, in the great city to come, there will be people from every language and tribe and clan. And they won't be singing praise to the Lord Jesus in Greek or Hebrew. They'll be singing, we'll all be singing in our, all our diverse languages under the harmony of Jesus Christ, the Lord of all creation. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, they had one language and common speech. Verse 9, it was reversed and the city was known as mix-up, confused, Babel, Babel. That's the name they earned. That's the reputation they gained. And many languages are sacramental of our pride, setting ourselves to replace the creator. Death, how unnatural. It's a reminder of our rebellion in Eden. The fact that we struggle to communicate across language barriers. It is a reminder of our rebellion at the Tower of Babel. He has scattered the proud and brought down rulers and lifted up the humble. There is no substitute for God. The city is a sacrament. Our scrambled language is a sacrament. They remind us of our rebellion and our deep-seated insecurity. Well, that's what a city is. Second last question. How are we as the children of light to live in such darkness? Is there a rainbow of hope here? No, all through the Bible, Babel is a mark of depravity, the incarnation of pride and rebellion. So what do you do when you find yourself in the middle of a city? Flee the city. Uh, set up monastic communities in the countryside. No, the people are here. Darkness is here. Pride is here. Our independence and slavish dependence on one another are here. And remember, if you're going to stay in the city, that such pride is highly infectious and 
You will be no good to the city if you catch the disease of pride. You will be just part of the problem. It's infectious, isn't it, here, when you go to the office and you talk to people everywhere you do. Independence and freedom from God is infectious. The addiction to other people and their estimates of you, it's very infectious. To put yourself first is very infectious. God spoke to Paul in a Greek city of Corinth and said, do not be quiet, do not be afraid. I have many people in that city. The rebelliousness of the city, God has his elect there and we are to be there in order to be part of the solution and bring them the gospel, which is the answer to all humankind's great needs. But how can I live in this city and resist the infection of pride? Well, it comes, does it not, from renewing my mind in the mercies of God to keep reminding myself of the mighty works of God, the gospel. That's what Watt said, isn't it? When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. How can I be part of the solution to this city? By living near the cross and by proclaiming the cross. I don't know if you saw last Tuesday, we spent all day last Tuesday nestled, camped in front of the television. And we watched the, order of fa the, the, the service of thanksgiving at St Paul's. And if you anticipated, as I did, the sermon of the Archbishop of Canterbury, you remember that he said in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen that we give thanks for her long reign. And he, caused, he, he, he encouraged us to see her dutiful service as an example to us all and that we should give ourselves like her to the humble service of society and we would gain a deep sense of joy. One newspaper said that it was a very confronting sermon. It was an exposition of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 18, the same reading as at the royal wedding of William and Kate, except the archbishop omitted the very first verse. Do you remember how those verses begin? I appeal to you, brethren... By the mercies of God, the gospel, the wonders of God, that alone is our defence against the infection of the city and that alone can give us the motivation and the strength to go out into the city as part of the solution. Or we can urge people to godly service and expel God from our thinking. What an urban Babel sermon that is if we do that. We want the service which God's gospel brings. We just don't want or preach God's gospel. And we need to remind ourselves tonight that we have a city there. Our city is coming and we are to get out and search for God's elect here. Why? Because of the mercies of God, because of the wonders of God, because of what he has done for us in the gospel of his, of his son. So brothers and sisters, I urge you tonight, don't wallow in Babel. Don't be slavishly dependent upon one another for your reputation. Don't catch pride and independence from God. Fix your mind on Jesus. Fix your mind on God's mercies. Fix your mind on God's wonders. Fix your minds on the gospel of God. For it alone humbles you. It alone saves you. It alone shelters you. It alone gives you security. It alone gives you the reputation which alone matters. The gospel alone meets every created, God-created need. And the gospel alone speaks the language of every human heart. God's mercies, God's gospel, be a living sacrifice in this city where the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. That's God's mercies. Love so amazing, so divine. That's the wonders of God. Requires my soul, my life, my all. Turn your back on Babel. Come to Jerusalem. Come to the gospel. Let the gospel mould you. Never leave it behind. Let it continue to renew you and move out in the search for God's elect here, knowing that we have a city there. Let's pray.
we thank you, our Heavenly Father, for placing us in this strategic spot, in this city. We thank you for our brothers who are visiting us tonight from other strategic centres. We pray, Heavenly Father, that that which would keep us here is the search for many people who are yours in this city who do not yet know you. We are insecure. We are naturally rebellious. We thank you for the gospel which has changed us. Continue to mould us in humility, we pray, and the security of, that comes from knowing that we stand in you. Continue to keep our minds on the gospel so that we reject the infection of the proud, rebellious city. And Heavenly Father, move us out as part of the solution, not the problem. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.